Okay, so let's carry on. We're at uh, this is single phase motors part two. Single phase motors part two. We finished just going through uh, universal motors. So we're going to move on to split phase induction motor. The split phase induction motor uses the principle of induction to operate and is therefore fundamentally different to the universal motor. Split phase induction motors are widely used in almost every variety of domestic, commercial and industrial machine requiring a single phase drive of between 250 watts and 3 kilowatt power rating. They can be separated into two general types. A standard split phase motor which uses a start winding connected in parallel with the main winding or a capacitor start motor which is similar to the standard split phase motor but has a capacitor connected in series with the start winding to improve its starting torque characteristics. Standard split phase induction motor. Let's have a look at that diagram there. You'll probably need that. Look at it. There's a split phase induction motor. It's got uh, various various items on that diagram that you will need to know. And there's a, a cutaway drawing of the of the same thing. Note in here, this little mechanism here is our centrifugal switch, as I described in the last video. And there it is. There it is. Construction. The stator is a is simply a yoke of silicon iron laminations with slots containing the field coils. The start and run windings occupy the same slots. The run windings being placed on the bottom of the slots and the start windings on top of the run winding. The uh, center of each start winding coil lies midway between the centers of two adjacent run winding coils. Okay, so as I talked about in the last video, um, uh, what did I talk about in the last video? The alternating magnetic field and the poles. So you can see our um, windings placed into the um, into the stator here, and we will see that it doesn't matter how many windings I have. If I've only got a single phase supply, then all of those windings are either going to be on or off at any given instant. There's no rotation. Um, so we have here is our run one of our run windings. This one pole is our start winding in the middle there. So run winding, and then it'll be the reverse side of that same run winding, another run winding, reverse side of the same winding, and then the start windings are in between. The rotor is a simple squirrel cage arrangement made up of copper bars and end plates being uh, the two being braised together. A more common method is to pour molten aluminium directly into the slots and cast the cage complete. Usually a fan is cast integral with the cage, so the fan is part of the casting, and the slots are skewed to prevent noise. So this is just, it's just conductors. We have our magnetic field on the outside, the magnetic field is moving, and the conductors are just going to chase that around, so it does, doesn't need to be complicated. Uh, note here again our centrifugal switch, so uh, some weights and levers, and there's a, a spring there. So the spring is holding the centrifugal switch closed until such time as the speed gets to the point where there's so much force it's going to pull against that spring pressure and open, which I, I tried to describe in the last video, hopefully it, um, it made enough sense, uh, but you can kind of see the, see how that works here. Construction continued. The centrifugal switch. So the start timing is short time rated, the start winding rather is short time rated, and to avoid being damaged, it must be disconnected as soon as it has served its function. This connection is by means of a centrifugal switch mechanism comprising spring weights situated on the rotor shaft. As I've talked about before, centrifugal switch, uh, the centrifugal forces acting on these weights are such that at approximately 75% of full speed they are thrown outwards and thereby levering a Bakelite bush that moves along the shaft to open a set of switch contacts mounted on the end plate of the motor. So the once we get to 75% the 75 speed then the um, the centrifugal switch is open, will open that centrifugal force. And that's what the, the contacts there look like. So when that's pushed, it's going to open the, it's pushed on the, on the motor shaft, it's going to open those contacts. The principle of operation. One of the major problems when supplying a motor from a single phase electrical supply is the difficulty of establishing a magnetic field from the stator windings that will rotate around the circumference of the rotor in a similar manner to that produced by a three-phase supply. So that's what I talked about before, right? A three-phase motor will, will have its own rotating magnetic field. Uh, it's just part of 
how it works. It, it can't work in any other way. But a single phase motor, it doesn't have it, has an alternating magnetic field. So we need to induce some sort of, create some sort of rotation. Remember the single phase AC supply creates an alternating magnetic field. Consequently, it does not produce the necessary starting torque that will create the initial movement of a rotor when at standstill. The exact recreation of the three phase, rotating, three phase rotating field is difficult to achieve. So various methods have been devised to make it appear as if the stator field is rotating. Split phase winding motor, split phase winding motor uses one of these methods. Look closely at the diagram on the following slide. The four poles, so two pairs of poles, represent two windings wide and parallel to the supply, placed around the circumference of the stator housing. The start winding has fewer turns and is of finer wire than the run winding. Therefore, the inductive reactance to resistance ratios of the two windings differ, causing a phase displacement between the start winding current and the run winding current. Right, let's just talk about that for a second because this is the heart of all single phase motor starting system phase displacement. So we know, we've talked about vectors and uh, phases, and we know that if with inductive and capacitive loads that the uh, phase angle is going to be different. The voltage will lag with um, capacitors and, the, uh, and it will lead with inductors. So if we think about it, if I've got a winding there and it's just alternating, I don't have rotation, I, I can't get true rotation. If I have another winding in there, and I can manage to get that winding to be slightly out of phase or a lot out of phase with the, um, with the main winding, uh, especially if I can calculate how much out of phase it's going to be. You know, we use the inductive reactance and the resistance and we draw a, a di uh, our triangle um, vector with our vectors on it. And then we can work out how far out of phase it's going to be. And then I place that winding physically at that same angle. So if it's 30 degrees out of phase, I put it 30 degrees, um, 30 degrees from the main winding on my stator. And then it's now we've got, think about that LED again, that on, 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 on. Now we've got that appearance of uh, rotation. It doesn't need to be there all the time. It only needs to start it. Once we've started it, then like I said before, if we turn the motor, then it will run on a single phase AC with just that alternating magnetic field of five. So we just need enough turn to get it started. And we do that by having a phase displacement. So we get one of the windings to be out of phase with the other. That's the, the heart, as I said, the heart of all types of motor, uh, single phase motor starting circuits. So this one is a uh, split phase, but there are various other types which we'll talk about. All of them are trying to do the same thing. We're cre creating a phase angle between the two windings. Um, so a different, uh, so the voltages on those two windings are out of phase and therefore the magnetic field will then appear to rotate. If that doesn't make sense to you, get in touch with me and we'll talk about it because this is, it's really important to understand that. It's just, that is how all of these things work. If you can get that, then everything else will start to make sense. If you don't understand that concept of how we're creating a rotating magnetic field by using a phase displacement, uh, everything else will be very, very hard. All right, so principles of operation. So here we have a standard split phase motor. We have the phase in there, we have a run winding, uh, and that runs back to neutral. Uh, we have a tap off there through the centrifugal switch to our start winding, and back to that point there. So effectively, uh, the start winding and the run winding are in parallel with each other. So they're both gonna receive full voltage uh, between phase and neutral. Now they position differently around the outside of the rotor, in the, in the stator, around the rotor. So that, as it said earlier, if we get a um, slightly different phase angle in the start winding because of the inductive reactance and the, um, the inductive reactance and the resistance and the ratio between the inductive reactance and the resistance mean that this will uh, either lead or lag, depend, uh, in relation to the run winding, we're going to have a slightly different phase angle there. And you can see that uh, on here, there's our um, north pole of our run winding, south pole of our run winding, north pole of the start winding, north pole of the uh, south pole of the start winding. And you can imagine there that if the uh, north here and the north here aren't occurring at exactly the same time, if there is even a small angle between them, then you're going to have that appearance of uh, phase shift or appearance of rotation. If we have um, 
if they were in perfect phase, then both of those would be maximum at the same time. Both of those would be maximum at the same time, the two selves, and therefore we just have alternating. But if I can get this one to come in slightly after this one, then I have a slight rotation, right? So this one is at maximum, this one's still coming up. When this one gets to maximum, this one is starting to decrease. My, my two sine waves aren't in phase with each other. So it'll give that appearance of rotation from this one to this one to this one to this one, and that gives us that circular motion in the magnetic field that we need. Uh, this displacement can be shown by a phasor diagram, like I said before, which shows the highly inductive run winding current lagging the start winding current by approximately 30 electrical degrees. 30 degrees, uh, well, I picked that number out of nowhere, but there you go, it's the same, same number as I said. 30 degrees. This is about the normal angle of lag for a standard split phase motor. Well, okay, if that's standard, if 30 degrees is standard, maybe that I didn't pluck that out of nowhere. Maybe I plucked that out of a deep recess of my mind that knew 30 degrees was about the standard. Um, I don't know. But there you go. So if our, our start winding and our run winding are generally about 30 degrees apart. 30 degrees electrically. So that's our, the difference in our phases if we look over here. So um, the the current and the start and the run windings are going to be 30 degrees apart, which gives us enough of a phase shift. The polarity of each pole is determined by the direction of the instantaneous current flowing in each winding. In the previous picture, the polarity of each pole can be found using the right-hand grasp rule and gives the polarity indicated. So there we have it there. We've, we've talked about that right-hand grasp rule before, the direction of magnetic field and the, so on and so forth. The magnetic field of each winding will strengthen and decay sinusoidally. That means that you know, as the voltage sine wave is put into the winding, then the magnetic field will increase and decrease in, in the same way as the sine wave does, right? At maximum voltage, I have a higher magnetic field and, and so on. Um, it's, it will be in unison with the AC current flowing through it. A delay in the buildup of flux occurs at the face of the run winding pole due to the 30 degree current lag between the windings. So the, uh, the run winding is going to be slightly behind the start winding. If the current is uh, 30 degrees lagging the start winding, then the magnetic field that's created, because the magnetic field is created by the current flow, then the magnetic field will lag as well. Uh, this gives the magnetic field a moving effect as the maximum occurring flux shifts, as the maximum occurring flux shifts from the pole face of the start winding to the pole face of the run winding. In magnetic field displacement picture, this flux shifts, flux shifts is in a counterclockwise direction. Individually, each winding still produces a magnetic field that simply alternates in polarity. So the north and south pole of my start winding and the north and south pole of my run winding are still just north, south, north, south. It's just alternating. However, the induced delay in flux buildup between the start and run poles is enough to create that rotating effect. Although it's not a rotating effect of constant magnitude. This effect will in turn produce rotor currents by magnetic induction in the usual manner, thereby creating a starting torque. So it creates a turn and therefore a torque in the motor. The motor continues to operate after the start winding has been disconnected because the rotor is in step with the alternating field of the run winding. So the rotor, once it's moving, is going to keep moving on that alternating magnetic field. It doesn't need that run, uh, it doesn't need it to be constantly uh, rotating. Typical applications, so limitations to its suitability for some applications occur because the starting torque produced is low and it has a tendency to run noisily when heavy loaded. Caused by the pulsating nature of the run winding stator magnetic field. These motors therefore tend to be used as drive loads that require low inertia and that are themselves noisy such as oil burners, bench grinders, washing machines, uh, dishwashers, fans, and air blowers. So stuff that's noisy. The motor's going to be noisy, so don't put it in something that you want to run quietly, I guess is the, is the lesson there. Um, note here that the starting starting torque produced is pretty low. Starting torque produced is pretty low. That's an important thing to note because we're not getting a great deal of phase displacement. 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 The only phase displacement we're getting under this method is just because of the slight difference in inductive reactance of those two 
um, coils is going to give us slightly different um, slightly different phase so 30 degrees is not much which means that if I don't have much of a difference in phase angle I'm not getting much of a rotation in my magnetic field on startup and therefore the start torque is pretty low so if I need a high starting torque as in it's directly connected to a very high load uh, this is not going to be a use, useful um, pump for me Okay, so starting capacitors. Well, if, as I said on the last slide, that I don't get a great deal of starting torque from my split phase motor because uh, I don't have a huge amount of phase displacement, how could I change it? How could I increase that? Well, changing the, the construction of the start winding is, is difficult and, and there's no promises there that uh, I'm gonna get a large phase displacement, right? Because the run winding is already going to be an inductor, so it's going to have a lagging current. So I'm working with two lagging currents here, one in the main winding and one in the start winding. Uh, and I'm just trying to get them to lag differently. But then if we think about, well, a capacitor will be the opposite, right? So as soon as I put a capacitor in there, now I'm not got dealing with two, two differently lagging currents. I've got one that's going to be leading. So that's way out of going to be way out of phase with my um, with my lagging current, isn't it? So I can use a capacitor then to do that. So after the introduction of small and compact electrolytic capacitors, an improved method of starting became a practical proposition. Before discussing the improvements gained by the addition of such capacitors to the circuit of the split phase motor, you need to appreciate the difference between the AC non-polarized electrolytic capacitor, which can be used for motor starting, and the DC polarized electric electrolytic capacitor which cannot. So we've seen DC polarized electrolytic capacitors, right? When we, um, we've used those in, uh, in our labs to, uh, uh, and, and we were aware that, uh, we use those for like smoothing stuff and we're aware that they were polarity sensitive. So they're polarized, whereas in AC, we want a non-polarized electrolytic capacitor. So the figure A shown, so that's yeah, this one here, uh, a metallic plate bears on an electrolyte and is connected to the positive Supply terminal, so it's positive connected on one plate. Looks normal. The plate and the electrolyte itself are the two electrodes of the capacitor. The negative terminal is simply a tag inserted into the electrolyte, which may be a liquid or a paste. Okay. Under the action of the applied potential difference, an oxide film is formed by electrolytic action on the positive plate, and this film is the dielectric of the capacitor. As capacitance is proportional to the effective surface area of the plate, remember that as the surface area of our plate increases, then capacitance will also increase. With the connection shown, the arrangement functions as a capacitor. That is, it stores a charge rather than conducts it. With the opposite connections, the capacitance is virtually zero because the oxide film is dissipated by reverse electrolytic action and a short circuit then exists between the electrolyte and the plate. So that's uh, the DC electrolytic capacitor, which is polarized. This uh, kind of explains why why it is polarized because basically we have one plate is what it's saying whereas one plate's a build up charge and on the negative side it's just a it's just a piece of wire so uh, so we can only build up charge one way if we do it the other way it doesn't doesn't really work and figure b so that one's figure b there where we have uh two plates and then we have our chemical electrolyte in the middle figure b the operation is similar to that previously described but as two identical plates are used, the device acts as a capacitor in either direction. The oxide film is very thin and may be easily punctured. However, it is self-sealing within limits because the, because the small leakage current flowing releases more oxygen from the electrolyte to react with the metal plate to form more oxide. A practical capacitor is manufactured from aluminum foil and electrolyte impregnated paper, the paper being sandwiched between the strips of foil. These capacitors should always be stored in a dry situation because they tend to deteriorate after about 12 months in a humid atmosphere. They are used because their capacitance is greater for a given volume than those with a paper dielectric. Oh, and they are cheaper. If a load requires a starting torque beyond the capability of a split phase motor, a capacitor start motor can be used. Right, so that mirrors what I said before that with that split phase motor, our greatest disadvantage is that low torque because we don't get much phase displacement. If I use a capacitor, then I can get a much greater phase displacement and therefore I get 
uh, bigger starting torque. And here is our uh, here is our capacitor start motor. Here we still have a centrifugal switch. Most of the other things are the same. Note the capacitor on the top there. And look, this is a pretty um, pretty standard arrangement. If you see one of these in real life, you'll see a sort of bulge off the top and it'll be a cover with a couple of screws. That's usually where your capacitor is. This is far, far more common uh, in real life than your split phase or even the universal motor. Um, I reckon the vast majority of motors that I've come across, certainly in commercial and industrial applications, will be some sort of capacitor motor. There are a couple of different types that we'll talk about, but. Um, Motors with capacitors, I guess that's the point there. Uh, the motor is similar to the split phase motor, as I just said, it's basically the same in the terms of the physical construction. It has the same number of turns and the same size wire on the run winding as a split phase motor of the same power rating. However, the start winding, as well as having a capacitor in series with it, has more turns of finer wire than the start winding of a split phase motor. So there you go, there's our difference. So the, uh, the main winding in a split phase or capacitor start winding, uh, if we had two motors that were identically rated, then the main windings would basically look the same. The start windings are gonna have to be different. Or, and we'll also have a capacitor in the capacitor start winding. Uh, torque is produced in exactly the same way as a split phase motor. The capacitor makes the current in the start winding lead the voltage and thereby increases the phase angle between the current and the run winding and the current in the start winding. Phase displacement of the two currents in the two windings can be nearly 90 degrees. That's what I was talking about earlier. Much bigger phase displacement in a capacitor. Um, compare this with the 30 degree phase angle in the split phase motor. The combined effect of the extra turns in the start winding and the inclusion of the capacitor is to increase the starting torque of the motor. This is because the rotating magnetic field during breakaway and acceleration to the speed at which the centrifugal switch opens is a closer approximation to a rotating field of constant magnitude through each cycle. What does that all mean? Well, that means that with the increased phase angle, I'm able to get uh, torque in the motor that more closely resembles a true rotating magnetic field. And therefore I get more torque on that starter. Give me a second, I'm just gonna pause a second because one of you is texting me, asking me a question about a test. Uh, wait. And I'm back. Was that seamless? How did that look? I don't know, I'll have a look after I finish recording. Operation of our capacitor start, uh, capacitor start motor. And here we have, it's nice isn't it that all these kind of diagrams look the same so we can just examine the differences. I encourage you to uh, open the PowerPoint and actually have a look at each of these kind of um, simultaneously or one after the other just so you can see how they all look. So what do we have here? Centrifugal switch that was common with the, um, the uh, split phase motor. So obviously at a specific speed that will open and then the rest of this part of the circuit will no longer be in the circuit. Um, we have our capacitor here, that's our starting capacitor, and our start winding, and then we have our run winding here. So our start and run windings are physically um, displaced on the on the stator, so one there, one there, or, or however they're arranged, but physically um, in different places. Uh, power current will run through there, through the run winding, back to neutral, and that current will be in phase more or less, and it'll be slightly lagging because of the uh, induction in that winding, but we're gonna have uh, current running through that run winding all the time. When we first start off and the centrifugal switch is closed, we have current going to the capacitor and then to the start winding. That start winding, because it has that capacitor in series with it, is then gonna have a leading current. It's gonna have a leading current, which then runs back to neutral. Then here we have the phaser diagram here. So we have our run winding has a slightly lagging current because by its nature, it's just an inductor. And then because we have the uh, capacitor in series with the start winding, we've got a nice leading start current there, and then we can see the angle between them. They're both about 45 degrees to zero for the voltage, but 90 degrees between each other, which means we've got a big phase angle displacement. So if you think then of where our windings are placed on our stator, uh, now I've got a true rotating, because I have this magnetic field comes on 90 degrees 
before this one and so on. Uh, rotation reversal. The reversing, uh, reversing the capacitor start motor is achieved by reversing the connections to either the start or the run winding, but not both. This can be done using an external reversing switch wired as shown in the following figure in which the connections to the start winding are reversed. In practice, you would be more likely to change the connections in the motor terminal housing by hand as external reversing switches are not commonly used and less frequent changes in rotation uh, direction are required, such as a small single phase alignment. Changing the connections to the run winding is usually easier. This is because the start winding may have an internal connection to the motor switch or capacitor making access points difficult to find. Uh, oh, that, look, that's not entirely true. So we, we do have, it, it is fairly common to have um, reversing switches. Uh, an example would be a garage door opener, right? We, nearly all of us will have one of those in the house. So the garage door opener, the motor has to change direction. It's going to go forward to put the door down and reverse and, and there'll be an external external reversing switch to do that and it will do exactly like this it's going to reverse uh, the polarity of one of the windings if we reverse the polarity of both of the windings let's have a look at this diagram here if we reverse the polarity of both of the windings at the same time then we've kept the polarity of those two windings the same in relation to each other and therefore the uh, phase displacement will still be, let's say start winding was ahead of the run winding. If I change the polarity of both windings together, start winding will remain ahead of the run winding. If I change the um, polarity of just one of those windings, then I'm actually putting them the other way around. So then run winding would be ahead of start winding or start winding ahead of run winding or vice versa, you get my point. And so then the effective, uh, the effective rotating magnetic field will change, change direction going to go the other way and therefore my motor will run in the opposite direction and so then we have our two pole reversing switch so at this point here my phase is coming down here it's going up through the centrifugal switch and down through the start winding from left to right the phase is going to the run winding top to bottom so start winding left to right run winding top to bottom uh, when I switch this over I'm switching both the neutral and the phase oh sorry it returns from the start winding back through here through this switch to the neutral when i reverse them now my phase is coming through here down to the opposite side of the start winding back through the capacitor centrifugal switch to here uh no here because that's now on the bottom and through this switch into neutral so now my start winding the current is running right to left so my run winding is still going top to bottom. See, phase coming straight down there. So, so this, the run winding is still top to bottom, but I've changed the direction of current flow through my start winding from right to left rather than left to right. So it's going to reverse the direction. And again, if I change the polarity of both of them, then uh, then their polarity relative to each other will, will be the same. So it won't do anything. The motor will rotate in the same direction. Typical applications by virtue of its higher Starting torque over the standard split phase motor, the capacitor start motor is used for driving pumps, compressors, refrigeration units and air conditioners or any other application where a single phase motor is required to develop a high starting torque under load. Yeah, so as I said before, we want that high starting torque under load, right? So pumps, compressors, refrigeration units, air conditioners. So as soon as that motor starts up, it's going to have a uh, full load on it. So it's got to be able to um, turn that whole load immediately. Uh, not for very long because it's going to get up to speed and then it'll be fine, but um, we need to have that uh, high torque at very low speeds or high torque at zero speed essentially. Okay, uh, second digit of your code for the test is a one. Second digit is a one. Next we have, let's carry on. Next we have the permanently split capacitor motor. Actually, no, let's stop there. Let's stop there. This will be the end of part two. We will come back with permanently split capacitor motor shortly.